Good morning and afternoon, everyone. I can see a few people jumping in. Hello, hello. Tamara, good to, good to have you here. Mark, Alexa, Scott, awesome. So we'll just let a few more people roll in um, as we start this conversation with Seth Godin. Seth, um, did I tell you that my favorite book is, um, is The Icarus Deception? Did you know that? I did not. That's very nice of you to say. Yes, 2012, right? Feels like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? <laughs> what, uh, as we let people roll in, what, what sort of prompted you, inspired you? What, uh, what came over you when you were writing that book or at least conceiving it? It's a book about indoctrination. Yeah. And, and um, indoctrination takes many forms. We live in a culture that's dominated by caste and by status roles and mostly by people from an early age being told they have to fit into an industrial system that wants to take from them as opposed to give them a foundation. And um, when I, I spent a lot of time with kids uh, and I also spent a lot of time, I don't do any professional coaching, but volunteering to help people. And when I see how deeply the indoctrination runs, I just mm -hmm. felt like naming it and pushing as hard as I knew how to push and um, mm -hmm. it's interesting because some people get it and some people don't, but that's all you can expect. And what we're seeing now is simultaneously our culture falling apart because the industrial backbone that kept everyone in line is fading. Some of it's negative and some of it's truly positive. And it's the kind of people that you attract that give us a chance to level things up. And that's our mission, you and me both, is Amen. to turn on lights and let, get out of people's way. Beautiful. So with that uh, indoctrination, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in. I mean, the, the, I'm just honored to have you here. So everyone, welcome. My name is Promise Filon. I am the founder and general partner of Growth Warrior Capital. Many of you already know who we are, what we do, but just to highlight, um, we have a strong and firm belief that uh, diversity wins. And so we are an early stage fund, as everyone knows, that backs um, founders who are women, diverse, of color, LGBTQ, et cetera. And so um, I had the pleasure back when I was a CEO back in my uh, uh, CEO days to meet uh, Seth Godin and out of nowhere, uh, I think I met you in 2003. I was 14 at the time. Uh, and you said, hey, let's write a book together. And so um, you allowed me to contribute alongside some other incredible people in the Purple Cow. And so I've been um, a fan and um, just an admirer of your work since then. And um, want to bring that here. So as part of being a venture capitalist, um, I'm bringing to this group my lived experience and the lived experience of others I respect. And so, um, you know, back in January, we sort of saw that the economy was twisting and turning and that was going to be a change. And then with the war in Ukraine, um, you know, and all the noise happening, and then whether we're, we're in recession or stagflation or what have you, it's getting harder to get messages heard. And so we, we started a, a series called In the Trenches, and it's where we bring the best and the brightest from around the world to talk to our portfolio companies. And so um, I'm honored to have Seth Godin here, if we can go to the next slide. Um, so I don't even know if there's not enough bullet points and there's not enough slide work to really just describe who you are. Mm. Look behind this man. Those are all of his <laughs> books. Um, Entrepreneur, successful entrepreneur, built a couple companies, exited, over 20 books, everything from The Purple Cow, um, All Marketers Are Liar, The Dit, like all, I've got every single one, but books that are really putting forward the importance of one thing, which is connection. It's about connection. And so I would call you the Dave Chappelle of marketing, sir. <laughs> <laughs> The GOAT, the greatest of all time, a marketer who can really cut through the BS. And so um, thank you, Seth, for joining us in this conversation about storytelling. So tell us a little about who you are, and then we'll move into a dialogue. Yeah, I, I, if people don't know who I am, they can turn out now. 
or they can stay. Either way, I don't want to waste people's time by going over my bio. I was looking for a copy of The Big Move so I could show people your name on the cover, but I don't know where it is. It's over here somewhere. Anyway, um, you're a rock star. The people on this call must be amazing because they know you, and I want to help them figure out how to get where they're going. So let's go. Let's go. So I'll leave with a quick story. So last night, um, I was honored to be at a dinner with the Deputy Secretary of Commerce, um, Don Graves. And so he asked us all to do our intros and we did what everyone else does. Here's my chronology of stuff, right? Blah, blah, I, I grew up here and horses and whatnot. And um, there was one person at the table who basically said, um, a year ago today, my father passed away. And all the, all the air in the room just kind of, and we started listening. And after she introduced herself, everyone was emotional. Yeah. And so as a venture capitalist, I'm seeing pitch after pitch after pitch that talk about product features and benefits and ideal customer profile in your world of experience and all that's happening right now. How do we start to think differently about how we talk about ourselves and the things that matter to us in the current times? Right. Okay. So we can go deep really fast here. First of all, the problem with an elevator pitch is no one ever bought anything on an elevator. And Silicon Valley really pushes people to have that polished elevator pitch, which is a perfect way for someone to say, oh, I've heard what you have to say. Now I can ignore you. The purpose of an elevator pitch isn't to pitch somebody on the elevator. It's to get someone to follow you after you leave the elevator and ask you questions about how they will benefit from what you do. It is not an elevator pitch. It is an elevator question. And when people like you who have to work their way through an enormous slush pile say, what is it that you do? What they're really asking is, why should I trust you? And is it interesting? What is the change you seek to make in the world? And if you've got a very polished, clever answer, I'm just going to ignore you because there's no room for me in what you just said. And so part of what I think I can add value for people is Nobody knows everything about you. Only one person went to every concert Jerry Garcia performed in, and it was Jerry Garcia. You can't know the truth of anything. What you can know is the story. And the story is something we get to create and then we get to live. And you have to decide if your story yeah. is going to resonate with the people you seek to change. And that's up to you which story you want to pick. But please don't tell me the engineering version of what you do, because you've already decided that that's not a story for me. Right. You said me twice as you, as you walk through that. And um, how, do you, how does one tell a story in a way that actually pulls you into the story? Because I feel the ones that I get, we saw several hundred pitches last year, several hundred. And the ones that got me excited were the ones where I could see myself in their future. And so what are the strategies to do that where it's more than we need money, we need you know, connections. What are some techniques that, that really sort of break through that clutter? Um, so money is an interesting question because, so I don't have any investments of any kind because otherwise I would go crazy. Um, but money is a shorthand that means different things to different people. Uh, $100 means something different when you're at a, uh, a restaurant celebrating than when you're trying to you know, make a payment for your student debt. Same $100, but the story feels different. So when you show up and say, I need $2 million, what does that even mean to the person who heard you say it? Right. What I have found, and I used to sit on the advisory board at Flatiron, uh, which became Union Square Ventures, yes. is if... And if an entrepreneur can say, the hard part of what I am trying to do is X. And in order to solve the hard part, I can use cash and I can show you that cash will solve the hard part. Then a smart investor says, I have cash and I believe what you just said. But on the other hand, if you say, I am trying to make a certain kind of change in the world. And now there's this amount of cash that I'm seeking. They're not related. Right. And most of the small businesses that I encounter should not raise money 
cannot raise money. And if they do raise money, they're just going to fail even more dramatically. Because just because it's important to you that you earn a fair living while you're doing this project you care about doesn't mean it's important to anyone else. And so, yeah, I'm going to open a chicken restaurant on the corner of this street and that street, and I need $2 million to get started. Nah, there's nothing that you just described to me that is an interesting problem or that is a hard problem that you can solve with $2 million to generate enough money to pay back right. the person who gave you $2 million. What you should do is become a chef at somebody else's restaurant because you really want to make chicken. You don't really want to run a business. Yeah. I mean, what you're talking about is really building connection and trust. Yeah. Because the, the money game is really a relationship game. And, and, and money is the cost of, of entry, right? Um, it's interesting. One of our entrepreneurs, Seth, uh, when I first met him, so during COVID, a lot of things happened, right? We all had the dark night of the soul and we were you know, alone or with people we weren't sure about. Um, and then George Floyd happened. And so one of the companies that we invested in when I, I met him the first time, he said, you know, when George Floyd happened, um, I had a panic attack. And, and so from there, my, my eyes were open, my synapses, follicles, everything was just open because now we're talking about something that affected us all, right? And so what, what seems to be happening, right? This is, this is my, um, my conclusion is we've moved away from wanting to have these vapid elevator pitches to wanting to have an emotional, especially if you're a woman and a person of color or LGBTQ, you're bringing to bear a different perspective on, on the world. So, so how, how do people lead into that? And we're talking about pitching now, how do they lead into that in a way that is grounding, but also not alienating to someone who might be right? Pale and male on the other side of the table. How does that conversation now happen that pulls you in versus pushes you away? Yeah. So, you know, part of what it means to be privileged in the dominant caste is that when you talk about things, I'm sorry, I got a new phone and I'm not good at putting it on mute. I apologize. Um, go away, go away. There it goes. Um, part of what happens when you show up as somebody who is from the privileged caste, it goes without saying that you can mention that you were at the Hamptons or what kind of car you're driving. These are trappings of one version of success. And they're, they go left unstated, but they're clearly seen by all the people who, who know secret handshakes. And it is a mistake to believe that they're correct. They're not correct. They just happen to have been the ones that were around for a long time, right? So yeah. I grew up as a, a minor outsider because of the spiritual background that I had and where I was from. But so I felt it a little bit, but I've never felt it the way somebody who has had a long history of being on uh, the, the short end of the caste and, and uh, racist stick. And given that that is said, when someone is showing up seeking connection, yeah. the universal is, I'm here to make a change happen because there is no investor who wants to invest in the status quo because the status quo does not accept investments. That the only way to win is to invest in a change. And so being really clear about the change you seek to make is super important because if the change is 100% on the social and cultural side, then somebody who's keeping track right. of finances is going to correctly say to you, this isn't a good fit for me because I need to find something that I can go back to my limiteds with and say, I just made 10X. On the other hand, if you want to make a social and cultural change and can describe how that change turns $5 into $10. Absolutely. Now you can talk to people who aren't necessarily aligned with your social mission, but see that your social mission is leading to a change that they seek to have. I love, I love the status quo. I love the idea of disruption plus economic impacts. I would add one piece, you know, talk about me. Let's introduce me, connect. Because part of what you're doing as an investor is you're putting your reputation on the line with a person and a group of people. And what I find, Seth, in this day and age is people get on, get on a call 
or meet or have you present and they go right into, here's my problem. Here's how big the market is. I want to fall in love because this is a 10 to 15 year relationship. Once that wire goes, this is, this is long. I mean, you were part of the guys who built one of the most successful venture firms, period. Union Square is one of the most successful, period. And they are very hands-on in the trenches with their portfolio companies, right? So I'm a Black woman. You are not. And so I want to know you and I want you to be, I want to be known and seen and heard in a way that allows us to find mutual ground. Yeah. And so I guess, help me, let me test this with you. Is it possible in my attempt to do that with you that I realize that we are not aligned and we can't work together? So is it possible that me telling my story, we sort of converge on the fact that maybe we're not the kind of people who should be in business together? Is that possible? Well, I think that, in fact, that's the goal. Yes. The goal is if you're going to find a good match, you're going to have to aggressively discard dozens of bad matches. Yeah. And I don't think the entrepreneur should approach this as a victim waiting to get picked or rescued. It's somebody who has an asset that is worth a great deal, your yeah. blood, sweat, tears, energy, focus, desire, and don't date losers. Right. So the idea is I'm going to pick two or three people to join me on this journey. And it might not be for you. Let me describe where I'm going, because if you don't want to go to Miami, this bus is going to Miami. Please don't get on it. Right. And what I think you will find is that the best investors actually respect that more. They don't want you to show up and say, what do you want? Oh, I have that. They want you to show up and say, this is how I'm going to devote the next cycle of my life. Do you want to come along on this journey with me? Right. And so the, the power in that is you told a story where now we can see our future in each other. I can see my future as an investor in you, and you can see your future as an entrepreneur in me. And so we make an agreement, we partner. So now let's talk about the market. We got a lot of startups set that are doing incredible things. And if they put a press release out or if they put news out, Ain't nobody going to see it. So in these moments where the market is so noisy, and it has been for, for years now, how does a, a company with a, a wonderful story and technology, how does it go to market when the news is like crypto wars and failing and winter and like, you know, we just had one of, we just had the Supreme Court overturn like, you know, a critical piece of our history. There's yeah. a lot. So do you not talk about your company? Do you just do account-based marketing? Like how does a company now get into the ether when it's full of noise and clutter? All right, so let's, let's be really clear. If we're gonna go far enough into the mass of okay. humanity, on average, no one on earth speaks English. They're speaking Chinese or some language is spoken in India. On average, People make $1,000 a month. On average, people have an Android phone. So you got to ignore the whole 7 billion for sure. So now maybe we're focusing on, maybe there's 300 million people in the United States. Is right. that your market? Well, so in the case of my work, I've had 20 bestsellers in a row and not one of them, not one has reached more than 1% of the US population in sales. I have 0% market share to a rounding error. That's enough. So you got to just walk away from the biggest possible audience and focus on the smallest viable audience, which is the group of 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 people that if they saw what you do, would see in that something that they need. That's all you need to change everything. And Steve Blank calls this idea customer traction. I call it the smallest viable audience. So what I would ask anybody who's got an actual business going right now is, would your customers miss you if you disappeared? Would the next cycle of customers miss you if you disappeared? If the answer is no, then I don't think your problem is you haven't raised enough money. I think your problem is you haven't made something meaningful yet. That if you have customer traction, the money almost always takes care of itself. And obsessing about customer traction 
figuring out who is going to explore and find what you make and say this, I need this. That's the opposite of the slogan. You can pick anyone and we're anyone. And most of the struggling entrepreneurs I have met, that's their motto is you've got plenty of options. I'm a little faster or cheaper than them. Please pick me. And that sucks away all your confidence and it doesn't make you worthy of investment because the investor knows there's somebody right down the street who can do what you do. Same thing. So give me some examples of people who are doing that well today. So if I think about my friend, Sean, who runs a chocolate company in Missouri, he was one of the first people to turn beans grown by some of the poorest farmers in the world into uh, bean to bar chocolate. But now there's more than 150 companies that do that. But what Sean does is he actually goes and visits people in Tanzania and the Philippines every year. He puts their kids through private school. He pays them five times the usual rate. He has open book management and he only sells his chocolate bars directly to retailers who sell them to the public. If you look at Askinosi Chocolate, they have customer traction. There are people who will leave a store that doesn't have Askinosi and walk down the street to one that does. He doesn't sell the cheapest chocolate. He sells chocolate that's close to the most expensive because for some people, it's worth it. And so when Sean writes a book about his journey, it sells a bunch of copies. When Sean sends a note to his fan base and says, summer's coming, we're going to stop shipping next week, a whole bunch of people order because he has customer traction. And the cool thing about Askinosi is he could raise money tomorrow and he doesn't need to because he knows who his customers are. His customers know who he is and he can scale the way he wants to. And if we go you know, all the way to the end to you know, a tech thing, there's a thing on my Android phone called Niagara, which is a launcher so that my home screen doesn't look like the ridiculous Johnny Ive home screen. It's just a list of all the apps I need in alphabetical order. I can get to anything I want in a 10th the time. It cost me $6 or whatever it is. And the guy who runs Niagara is making a very fine living. And people like me, the first thing we do when we see someone with an Android phone is tell them about Niagara. Again, customer traction with a slight network effect in a very specific setting. And I can come up with 40 more of these. The point of all of them is they are personal about the user. They're not personal about the creator. They're not personal about the creator, they're, pers they're personal about the user. So you, you gave two phenomenal examples. So the first one is that smallest viable market is unified by purpose, right? I believe in what this chocolate company is doing. I love their open book policy. They're taking care of people in Africa. But the second is solving a very specific and simple pain point elegantly, right? Yeah. Is there a third? Well, I would say the third one, the one that you really want to seek, the reason, yeah. as far as I can tell, more than Moore's Law, that VC has worked so well for the last 20 years is the network effect, which is, will this work better if I tell my friends? It doesn't work if you are the only person with a fax machine or an email account, because you can't send an email to yourself, right? That email only works if other people you work with have email. That the secret of Microsoft's success, often unstated, is the network effect. You had to get other people to switch to Word from WordPerfect because otherwise you couldn't share your files. That if you have anything to do with tech, you better have a network effect built deep into what you make. And um, uh, Andrew's book, The Cold Start Problem, yes. goes into great detail about how to solve this. If you don't have a network effect, I don't want to invest in you. And I don't even invest. But if I did invest, I would only invest in companies that have a network effect. <laughs> we'll call you. I, I love that, that third one because it, it's making it valuable to others. And by the way, that drives wonderful unit economics, which every VC cares about. There's a company that um, we invested in, which basically is a, um, a savings and investment app for migrants and minorities. And what it takes into account is an understanding that, that migrants and minorities have trust circles. So yep. these are communities that don't trust big banks and, you know, right, um, but trust each other. 
And so I can go and get my whole family and all of my cousins and friends and whatnot to come in. And now 10 of us are all saving, competing, aligning together. So that network effect, right, is, is one of the things that builds the smallest viable. Oh, wait, uh, let's put a pin in this for a second. Probably, go, for it, go for it. I'm wondering yeah. if the people who are building this, if at every single interaction, every design review, every tech cycle are saying, how do we put more network effect in? Or are they focusing on something else? Because if you are obsessed with the network effect, you're going to build a totally different app for savings than you will if you are obsessed with how do we get people more basis points? How do we make the UI easier to use? That's not what's going to make it work. What's going to make it work is how do I overcome the built-in anxiety I have of talking to my friends and family about money? enough that I will talk to them about this app. Because if I don't do that, you're, no never gonna have enough, you're never going to have enough money to build what you're building. So what's your advice then? Well, the question is, if I could build a circle of 20 people, what do I get? It's probably not more money because the idea of pimping out my friends and family for money... <laughs> doesn't work in many yeah. cultural circles. But what else may do I get? For example, if I can help my friends and family get join the circle, do they get money, right? Or yeah. do they get access to all sorts of other things? When I build this community, this circle, do does the whole circle gain in power? And I want to commend people to the first six minutes of the first Godfather movie, because you can find it online. You will learn an enormous amount about how human beings make decisions. And what happens in this six minute scene is the undertaker, which they picked it because it's the lowest status in all of our culture, right? Yeah. He's, he weighs 98 pounds. He's a skinny drip of a guy, also low status, comes to see the Godfather who is in his circle, smallest viable audience, very high status. And it's his daughter's wedding, a moment of high status. And in the Sicilian tradition, if someone made up, if someone asks you a favor on your daughter's wedding day, you have to say yes. If you don't, you lose status. So the undertaker comes to the Don and says, I want you to uh, either hurt or maim the two men who assaulted my daughter right. because I went to court and they got off with a warning. And the Don looks at him and says, why didn't you come to me first? That's the first thing because yeah. status was lowered. And second, he said, I can't grant you this wish because if I did, I'm paraphrasing, I'd be a hoodlum. I'm not a hoodlum. I'm the Don. I don't just do shootings for money. Right. And only when the undertaker approaches the Don with a different prospect, is it possible for the Don for, to find a way for them to work together? So when I think about what is money even for once I have fed my family and put a roof over my head, it is an arbiter of status and connection. It is not about let's play by you know, the, the rules of, of JP Morgan. It's what does it mean to be a vibrant member of this family and of this circle? That's what I would build into the app every single day. So it looks nothing like chase.com. It has nothing in common with chase. Yeah, it's, it's this lubricant. I mean, again, speaking as someone who has this role, um, I want everyone to win. I want us all to rise. And so that, that emotional connection to an app would get all of us to talk about. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm struck by the, by the example of the Godfather because I feel like um, emotions, pride, position in this caste system is really what drives buying decisions. It also is what bu drives buying decisions inside of corporations, right? Yeah. How, will, how will this be perceived? Will I lose my job or will I be perceived more um, in a higher regard if I, if I make this decision? How do young companies overcome that when inherently buying their product is risky, 
right? So if you buy my product over this, you know, IBM example, um, this is a riskier product. Yes, it has different, more capabilities. So how do companies as part of their story overcome the inherent risk in working with a startup? Yeah, I think it's really important to not pretend that it's not risky because you can't outdo IBM on the non-risky scale. So I can't help but show you this. Um, so this is uh, Roger's product adoption lifecycle. Yes. And what it shows is that in any market, but particularly in technology buying, two and a half percent of the people are innovators. They just want something that's new. 13 and a half percent of the people are early adopters. They want something that's new that works. And then you've got the early majority, the late majority, and the laggers. When you call on the purchasing department, when you go in the, the main email box, when you are showing up for the masses at a big, boring company, you are talking to people in the late majority, maybe no even some laggers. Yep. Their job is to waste your time. That's what they're there to do, to take the meeting and just stall. You can't dance with those people. Like I built one of the very first internet companies before the World Wide Web. And I could get a meeting with anybody. And we realized a year and a half into it just how much of our time we were wasting yeah. because we were going to big companies that we thought would be perfect partners and they would listen and listen and listen and listen and never close the sale. So the breakthrough for me came when we, my head of sales and I were in this meeting with a Fortune 100 company and they had like their 40th objection in the meeting. And so I had a briefcase in those days. I shut my laptop and I closed my briefcase and I say, it's really clear this isn't for you. And I get up to leave. And my head of sales, we had worked hard to get the meeting. It's, what are you talking about? I've only been here for seven minutes, but he didn't say anything. He's like, look at me. And we were halfway into the hall before they chased us into the hall and made us come back. And then we closed the sale because what we said to them is, yeah. we're going to create a situation where it is more stressful for you to say no than it is to say yes, and we will not accept a maybe. That being able to go to someone and say, we are on the cutting edge. We are doing something new. If you don't want something new, great. We won't come back. But if you want something new that you can brag to your bosses about, I need a yes from you. And right. let's get real or let's not play. So there's two books to recommend, Jeff Moore's Crossing the Chasm and I Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play. Because my argument is, there's not one person on this call who should try to cross the chasm. You are five years away from crossing the at chasm. Least, at right? least. Right? So when, 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 Slack, when, when Slack came out, sorry to interrupt, when Slack came out, Slack didn't pretend that they were run by Microsoft. Slack was Stuart's company that was a game company. And if it's not for you, go away. Can you put that back up again? I think that's a powerful um, uh visualization for this conversation. So the thing that keeps, I keep coming back to Seth is the smallest viable audience, the small, smallest viable market. How does a company qualify in? Because the early adopter relationship isn't just, we're going to do all this stuff for you. We also need you as a customer to do things for us. And right. so what ends up happening is sometimes the, the early majority or late majority will smell and look like early adopters because they have budget and they're curious, but they will have no willingness to do the work of the yeah. innovators and early adopters. So how does a company build a relationship or qualify in the right, the right yeah. partners? Yeah, all right, so let me talk about the software we're using right now. This is called, um, its actual name is Mm-hmm. And they- uh, Phil uh, yeah, yeah, Evernote CEO. He did some things right and he did a ton of things wrong. First of all, he raised $100 million, which is absurd. But secondly, at the beginning, if you wanted to use, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you had to apply to be in the beta. You had to yeah. tell them what you were going to do with it. And you had to be prepared to pay for it. That's my recollection. It might not be true. So for someone who does what I do for a living, it's fantastic because I just threw that slide up and everyone's like, wait, he didn't ask for screen sharing. It just works, right? But then they raise $100 million and they say, this is now software for everybody. And they had all these backgrounds and they had all this stuff for the mass market without a compelling reason for the mass market to switch. The mass market never wants to switch. They tried to leap the chasm, not cross the chasm without doing the hard work of dancing with people like me who 
who would pay 10 times what they charge. So your opportunity begins with, do we have an actual innovation, whether it's in the story or in the software, that people truly, truly care about? At least 10 people. If there aren't actually 10 people who truly care about it, go talk to your tech people again, because we can't have the rest of the conversation. Then we audition innovators. We don't ask innovators to pick us. We ask innovators to qualify for this thing that we have that's so great that they want to take the time to qualify. And we make it very clear to them what the rules are, right? So the only way you're going to be allowed to use this is if you're like this, like this, like this. And most people are going to say, screw that. I like the status quo. Fine. It's not for you. But I'm going to have customer traction with 1,000 paying people who are going to call my number. I'm giving them my cell phone number. I'm the CEO, the head of UI. And they're going to call me when something doesn't make magic for them. Right, right. And I'm going to charge them for the privilege and I'm going to make a promise to them, which is this is going to be worth your time and your money. And if you can't actually make that come true for 100 people, don't call promise, don't ask for her money because we don't need you. We need you after you figured that part out. I love the idea of audition. Because you don't need that many people. Do you remember Superhuman? The yeah, I, I use Superhuman. Tell me, what, tell me what that process was like. Okay, so Superhuman says, there are people like Seth Godin who have answered 147,000 emails since he started counting. It's true, I'm not exaggerating. Yes. And that's my app, right? I live in email. Let's figure out how to save that person an hour and a half a day. Yes. And let's do something audacious, which is emails free. Our email costs a dollar a day. You don't have to pay for it, but if you don't pay for it, you can't have it. Do you want something that does that? Now that's a very big promise. Right. So they use their tiny network to get Brad Feld, who I know and respect to say, yes, they kept their promise. It's saving me an hour and a half a day. Now I don't know about you, but, an hour and a half is worth a dollar to me. It's a lot, yes. So, so I go online and they say, oh, well, there's a waiting list of 8,000 people in front of you. And we're not adding people that often. We're auditioning people to see who wants to be our next customer. Well, I reach out to Brad. Brad gets me to the front of the line. So I already feel connected <laughs> to what's going on here. Then they say, you can't use the software until our CEO flies to your office and sits with you for an hour to make sure you know how to use it because we don't want you to use it just for fun and then say it doesn't work. Now, I think it's more than the CEO, but for the first, I think 8,000 people, they onboarded each person in person. And you say, well, that doesn't scale. I say, exactly, that's brilliant because now they have 8,000 people who are paying them, do the math, 8,000 times 300 is a very big number, enough to pay all payroll. They have 8,000 people who can't live without the software and there's a button built right into it that says, click this and your friend can get to the head of the line. Well, now I've got this gift I can give people, right? And they've made a big promise to me, which means, and it's still true, when something doesn't work in Superhuman and I send a note, I hear back from them within 15 minutes because I earned it by being there early and by paying my dollar. They don't get to say like Google does, well, it's free, don't complain. Right. They, they, you're, you're the key person. And as a result, Superhuman has enough money in the bank now to last them forever. What they do next is a whole other conversation that's premature for this call. But the point is, if you can't build something as cool as Superhuman, you shouldn't, do, you shouldn't be on this call and you shouldn't be trying to raise money because there's lots of places you can get a decent job. But right here, right now, you could change the life hour and a half a day of somebody, whether they're you know, a privileged white guy or someone who just needs a bank, where they're going to say, I'm really glad I found you. I am blown away by this concept of audition, but I think Superhuman did it the best, to your point. So what we're talking about is using scarcity and a promise of future um, abundance to get people to audition. Yeah. There's only going to be a few. And when we get those few, we're going to over deliver for them. And oh, by the way, you know, here are all these gates, gate, gates, gates, gates. So I, I feel like most startups 
live with a little bit of anxiety about this. Yeah. Right. Because they think, A, we need to scale fast and grow like LinkedIn and get all this, you know, you know, get multiplicity and exponential growth by X, X, X. And, and VC can reinforce some of that fear, right? Um, not here, obviously, growth warrior capital, we don't sign up for any of that crap. But there is a fear that if I don't do it, someone else is going to do this faster or beat me to it. So how, from an emotional standpoint, how does a founder commit to that because it could take longer. It does keep you in the seed or the early stage longer. What's the, what's the potential risk of that from their perspective? Well, I think the, the, the actual truth of it is that you know deep down your stuff's not that good. And you might be able to say it's not that good yet, but you know it's not that good. And if you want, counter examples of the people are going to steal my thing. Facebook was really easy to steal. And Facebook said, you can only use it if you're at Harvard. And then they say, you can only use it if you're at Harvard or Yale. And then they said, you can only use it if you're at an Ivy League college. And it took, I think, a year before the public could use it. So for that whole year, anyone could have stolen it. But you know what they couldn't steal? Their network effect. Yeah. Because if you wanted to be connected to the people they were starting with, the only people who could do that was Facebook. And so as somebody who has often told the truth in advance, because that's what you have to do to create <laughs> change happen, is you got to look in the mirror and say, okay, this might not be true yet, but why do I believe it will ever be true? What conditions am I creating? Right? So we just did this. This is the Italian edition. This is the Dutch edition. When I started building this in September, all volunteers, including me. And in six months in multiple languages, uh, 100, how many of that? 97,000 word book. It was, it didn't exist when we started. Nothing exists when you start. But at every single step, gates, as you call them, yes. there was something here that was worth it. The journey was worth it. So can you find a customer to audition simply to play with your whiteboard? I think you could. Sure. Could you find a customer to audition to play with a beta that doesn't purport to actually be a whole solution to their problem? You probably could. But what you have to do is tell the truth in advance that at some point, it's actually going to be significantly better than you've got right now. And that's scary for an entrepreneur. So most entrepreneurs instead say, hey, we're doing our best. If we just had more money, we would do better. We're going to make our project bigger and we're going to make it appeal to more people. And then they fail because that's not, we won't miss you if you're gone. I love that entrepreneur. And this is the last point I'll make before I open it up. I love the entrepreneur who says, we know that our product isn't strong in these three areas, but it's going to be, and here's how we're going to get there. And when we get there, here's the payoff, right? And it's very clear, but they don't, try to sell the payoff that they don't have yet, right? Yeah. There, there's a truth that's told up front. So um, we've got a lot of questions starting to come in. I, I want to um, open it up if you're ready to have Bring some it on. conversation. Okay, so um, Sunshine and Scott, you guys are gonna have to help me. But the first question comes from Mark Kep. Um, he says, um, I love this concept, Seth. Give me some ideas talking about um, auditioning on how to implement it after the fact meaning we do have innovators and we want to do the invite in the same way that you talked about with regards to superhuman. So how do they go backwards and create the audition? All right, so again, I'm gonna encourage you to do nothing that scales. Find the thing that couldn't be scaled under any circumstances. Airbnb. Because yep. That is when you're gonna find your sweet spot. So that, that's the first thing that I would say. Um, and the second thing I would say is um, there's a great book I always get the name backwards. I think it's called rocket surgery or, or um, yeah. It's about how to design a website that people actually understand. It's a super simple approach that when you're not standing there and they're looking at it, they know what you're trying to say. So what I would do if I had an underlying technology is right, you've already gone down one path, build a different website for the audition thing and just start with a deep breath and say, Here's this promise we're going to make. 
here is why someone should believe the promise. And here's what they have to do to get our attention in a dance with them. And if you can't tell me why I should believe the promise, no one's going to want to audition. Right. right. But if I say coming to Broadway, Denzel Washington and this person and this person in a version of Shakespeare's whatever. Well, I know who Shakespeare is and I know who Denzel is and I know what Broadway is and I know there's going to be a waiting list. So yeah, I'll send my 10 bucks in to get first dibs for tickets because you just persuaded me that right. it was worth auditioning. So sell, sell the sell the outcome and the economic impacts as part of the um, as part of the promise. But sell them in a way that you have authority to sell them. You can't just assert because most people aren't going to. I wouldn't have believed superhuman if Brad hadn't vouched for them. Yeah, and that's where the trust comes in, right? Um, you know, superhuman. When I got introduced it already had those, um, those references, those are really hard to get. So I, I would add, you wanna get the hard customers. So yes. when I was building companies, I didn't wanna get the easy customer that everyone got. I wanted to get the CEO of Intuit. You know, I wanted to get the hardest person on the planet to get. Um, so we just got the name. So Steve Kr uh, Krug, uh, Rocket Surgery Made Easy, the do-it-yourself yes. guide to finding and fixing usability problems. We will send that out as part of it. Um, I have not read that book. Thank you, Sunshine, for uh, the, the help behind the scenes. So I would add to your, your comment around um, auditioning is get customers who will be hard on you and who yeah. will be hard on your products. Also, but I, gotta, I wanna clarify one thing. Go for famous, it. famous customers are not nearly as good as useful customers. Same so, well, so for example, if, if you send me something over the transom and say, please blurb my book, I'm slightly famous, but I'm not going to do anything for your book because I got too many other things on my plate. But if you find someone who's much less famous, so Quicken's a famous company, I would find the CEO of a much less famous company who has more leverage because they have more time and more focus to really get in the trenches with me because the people who are at whatever top of whatever little thing you're looking at, they're the ones who are getting 90%. Everyone applies to Harvard. Very few people apply to Grinnell. Grinnell will give you a better experience than Harvard. Right. Go to Grinnell. Right. That's what I'm saying. So that odd, the customers who are auditioned, I only have a pain. They will give you the time and the resources necessary to truly Correct. bang on your products. No, I love that. Um, so uh, let me open it up now. So I know that you guys are probably begging to uh, have, have me slow down and give us some questions. So please feel free to either raise your hand um, and ask questions or to put those questions into the chat. Thanks, and Just Just because I want to make sure I'm doing my calendar right. I've got like 10 minutes left. Is that got what you 10 have? 10 minutes left. That's exactly. I've got uh, 1248 on the clock, your time, okay. Eastern okay. time. Excellent. One of the things, um, one of our, our companies that's, uh, here is um, they create um, technology, uh, virtual reality technology for um, assessing everything from compliance to um, uh, tolerance within corporations. And so people wear these and, you know, am I racist versus let me put you through a couple of scenarios, gets a very different response. Sure. It's a controversial um, solution. How, how would you get organizations who would you target for right. that for that smallest viable? Okay, market? so who in the organization has a problem that they are trying to solve? Because you can look from the outside and say this organization clearly has problems, but the CEO is unlikely to be the person at an organization of scale who right. is, but there's someone whose job it is to make a certain kind of ruckus in a way that if it, works well, they will gain an esteem or status. Right. So if you can go to that person and say, yes, you can do this sort of DEI thing, but no one's going to notice. You can do this sort of DEI thing and it might get you fired, or you can do this sort of DEI thing and it will get you seen as tech friendly and in a leadership position in a way that is both provocative and safe for your career. There aren't a lot of people in that seat, but there are some. And when you go to that person, you can ask the obligating question. If blah, blah, blah could happen, is this the sort of thing you want to do? Right. If the answer honestly is no, then don't try to change their mind. If it's yes, that would make my boss feel like I was doing my job. 
Now you have the chance to say, all right, can we pilot this with six people on your team? And if you get the feedback you need from those six people, are you interested in doing it for 60? Right. Notice that nowhere in this conversation is how much does it cost? Irrelevant, not my money. I'm not spending my money on this problem. It could be a million dollars if it's gonna help my career and I can get my boss to say yes, fine with me. And so again, what we're looking for is somebody who woke up this morning with a problem that they know they have. And if you can go to them without telling them what the tech is, just to explain the change you are able to make right. for them selfishly in their career, they're way more likely to take the meeting. I love that. And, and one of the other questions is how to think about pricing when you're in this audition stage. Is the pricing and packaging important or is creating a, a winning solution? So how do you prioritize the two? Right, so money is a story. If we are selling to businesses, the story is simple. Does this cost more than what I'm currently using or not? Right. If it costs less, then all I have to say to my boss is, it's the same thing, but cheaper, I'm done. If it costs more, I've got to be able to say to my boss, this is worth it because of X, Y, and Z. And if I can't say that, I'm going to just turn you down. So the goal for someone who's here to make change, I think, is to charge more, perhaps a lot more than what they're used to, because that puts you on the hook to explain why the change you create is worth it. On the other hand, if you actually have a technical innovation that allows you to deliver quality for less, you can go to the races with that. Those are just pretty rare. And they're, it's, it's less sustainable than one that's got a premium. I, yeah. I, I hear that. I mean, I'm not sure what superhuman costs today, but it's not a dollar. <laughs> it's not a dollar. Um, well, that's interesting. And so I guess from a, a, market, a marketing perspective and for thinking about going beyond that early innovators, how should people be thinking about expanding beyond? Like, when is it the right time to go beyond the smallest viable market? When is the, what are the triggers? What are the, um, the, um, the early indicators that you have reached that stage? The biggest one is the network effect. You don't go beyond the market. The market goes beyond the market. If you can build any company you want, why don't you build one with a network effect built in, right? So when I came out with this book, I, I had been kicked out of the book publishing industry and I self-published this, but it was built to share and it got shared. And then when I did the idea virus book, I only got 3000 people to read it, but it ended up to 3 million in 90 days because it was built to share. So that's the first thing is the network effect is your friend. And then the second thing is, I don't think you ever go past the minimum viable audience. Starbucks, I think most people here would be delighted to be the CEO of Starbucks. Starbucks is not consumed by the majority of Americans every day and around the world, much less than that. That's fine, right? It's not supposed to be for everyone. It's for someone who wants a certain kind of setting at a certain kind of price with a certain kind of flavor profile. That's what they sell. And if you don't want that, we don't have it. Well, I mean, they've created a massive market. So they've gotten people to conform to being the smallest viable market is what you're saying. So now we- Well, what I'm saying is if someone goes to Dunkin' Donuts, they, or McDonald's, there was a leadership moment at Starbucks when they used to say, that's our customer. We shouldn't have let that happen. And then Howard got back involved and he said, no, if someone wants to go to McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts, give them the directions to McDonald's and Dunkin' Donuts, be gone. They are not our customer. Yeah, I mean that that's that's huge because Dunkin' Donuts sells a lot of a lot of coffee. Um, so does McDonald's, but the premium price point for um, right for Starbucks makes us all want to be the CEO of that company or at least on the board. So there's something about that because a lot of startups will say, we're going to first go after the small, medium business. And they talk about the, the demographics of the customer. How, how would you describe the smallest viable customer for, um, mm -hmm. is it someone who is like, when you took over that product and started using it, what was the, what was the smallest viable customer for that? Right. So I think Phil is totally bungled it. And I've told him this, um, the smallest viable audience for mm -hmm, are professionals who are willing to pay money 
to do a better presentation in Zoom than right. anybody else. Interesting. That it was, you know, me being able to pull that slide up, that was worth 50 bucks right there. That was, right? was great. Right? Because I could have just said, oh, wait, I'm going to open Keynote. Can you please share? share right? nah, 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 nah. And how many people are there like me? I don't know, 50,000. So if there are 50,000 people paying them $20 a month, that's a fine business. And that is missed when you start saying, wow, we got clever ways for you to have a green screen and fish swimming in the background. No one's going to pay for that. And it's, if people start paying for it, Zoom's going to build it in as a free feature. And then they got nothing. Done. So the opportunity was to say, there are some people who have a problem in Zoom. Not many, but some. And we solve it so completely and with such a powerful network effect, because guess what? Seth's presentations are going to work better if he can persuade Promise to install it when they're working together. They didn't build any of those tools. And instead, they're focusing on building tools for non-users and non-payers instead of obsessing about the fact that they actually solved the problem and they could have doubled down on that. This goes back to number three, the network effect. So um, purpose bonds us, specific pain points bonds us, and the network effect. So the questions are rolling in. Let me try to hit a couple of these, Seth, so, so we can get um, to some more insight. So uh, thank you for sharing your feedback on network effects. How do you think about building network effects for a new category of products? Um, uh, so this company has a brand suitability score. Right, I see it. Yep. Um, okay. And that's for ad buys on podcasts. So basically right. keeping, you know, brands that want to have a certain image out of the wrong kind of podcasts. Right. So okay. How, how would they, so that's do- not, that's not a network effect question yet. And there is somebody who is not the CEO who is buying ads on podcasts Yeah. and they are living in fear that they will have an ad run on a Nazi podcast and they will get fired. And They also live in fear that they're going to buy ads that don't run and get charged for them. There's a lot of fear associated with what they're doing. Yeah. And so if a standard comes to pass so that they can click one box and make some of their fear go away, they will click the box. So your job is actually, how do we create the conditions where an industry that needs for there to be a standard picks our standard as the standard? Because the industry does not want there to be four standards for how you create a safe environment for podcast ads. So all of your work, all of it has to be about how do we gain that standard in a way that other people believe it is true. And you can find plenty of other industries where standards like that have evolved. Sometimes like, you know, in, 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 when we saw it with the credit default swaps, it can be misused, but when totally. Moody's and whatever, that was a standard from a private company. A standard, yes. So how that's your that's the hard part. Everything else you're doing is not hard. That's the hard part. That's the question you got to ask yourself over and over and over again. How do we become the standard? How do you define the standard so that you can become it? Who are the seven people who will get you to the 49 people to the point where it's blessed? And that is a social problem and a culture problem and a communications problem. It's not a tech problem. I love it. Um, all right, one last question. Thank, thank you, Tamara, for your question. Um, I find there's a lot of pressure to demonstrate revenue beyond the early adoption or um, the uh, smallest viable market or audience. So what are your suggestions for reorienting that conversation and refocusing on the power and value of the smallest viable? Okay, so first of all, if you don't actually have a vibrant, small, viable market, it will sound like people are criticizing the the whole smallest viable market. What what they're really actually saying to you is you didn't prove to me that there is this core group of true fans who are paying you right now. You're just mishearing the feedback or (laughs) you're talking to the wrong investor. And the fact is, if you got a thousand people paying you a thousand dollars a year, you don't need to raise money desperately to make payroll because you're already making payroll. And you can calmly and quietly audition investors the same way you're auditioning people in your smallest viable audience. Most entrepreneurs struggle because they don't have the first part, which is there aren't a small group of audition customers who are paying you 
rooting for you and helping you make your product better. Traction. That's the hard part. You cannot cover it up by getting Andreessen to invest $50 million. I mean, if he does, congratulations, go have dinner on me, but he's probably not. So instead, what we've got to do is get really clear, looking seven, 12, 14 people in the eye and getting them to sign on for the change we seek to make. If you can't get customers to do that, you shouldn't be wasting your time with investors. Incredible wisdom, Seth. I mean, we could do this. Let me just summarize a few of the incredible things that you've talked about. Smallest viable market is, right, uh, clap for that. Um, and the importance of the network effect is part of building your purpose and your story and your product. Getting customers to audition, that's going to make you a billion dollars, Seth. I'm not sure how yet, but I, I think it will. <laughs> Um, and then telling the truth in advance with being honest about the conditions that are required to create that as a reality. It's just magnificent. Um, thank you, friend, for being here. I love seeing Anytime. you. And um, if people want to reach out via email, can they, send, can they send an email to us or directly to you? People can email me, but know that it's my addiction and also know that I'm not going to be able to change your life. I'm just going to write back a nice note, but I am not going to invest and I'm not going to be your coach and I can't mentor you. And I'm sorry about those things in advance, but yeah, it's Seth Godin at gmail.com. I'm not that hard to find. Thank you, sir. We'll you're a rock star. Truly. You're a rock star. Bye-bye. Thank you, Seth. Bye everyone. Bye-bye.